Hi there, a while ago I bought another USB tester. It's the TC66C from Wudeng. It sells currently for about $28 from Banggood. I bought mine for £20 in December. As you can see, the TC66 is absolutely tiny compared to my other testers. That's because it's a dedicated USB Type-C tester, so no need for bulky USB Type-A connectors. This is the TC66C version, C meaning with Bluetooth communication, but nearly all of this review is applicable to both, so I'm using TC66 most of the time. The TC66 is complicated and USB Type-C is complicated. For those who want to know more, I made an accompanying video where I go over the boring bits, USB Type-C and the inner workings of the TC66 in more detail. This video is more about the practical aspects. If the TC66 looks a bit untidy in this video, it's because I have not removed the protective foil over the display and it's starting to peel off a bit at the corners. The TC66 has a USB Type-C plug on one end and a USB Type-C socket on the other. It's bidirectional and it does not matter which end is connected to what. The new thing with the TC66 is that it has a micro USB port, which can be used to power the TC66 and exchange measurement data. In addition, the TC66C version has a Bluetooth low energy radio. On the top you see two push buttons named K1 and K2 in the manual to work the menus and two sliding switches called PWR for power and PD for power delivery. I explain the PD switch later. If PWR is switched to on, the TC66 draws its operating power from the USB Type-C, like a conventional USB tester, which means of course it needs to see a minimum voltage of about 3.2 volts, and its own current can cause an error when measuring the capacity of a battery. If the PWR is switched off, the TC66 needs to be fed from the micro USB port. The advantage is that it does not add any load to the USB Type-C current flow and it can now measure voltages down to zero. What the manual doesn't tell you is that if the micro USB is kept plugged in and you leave the PWR switch on, the TC66 uses micro USB power until the voltage of the USB Type-C becomes greater. It then gradually transitions to use the Type-C voltage. During the transition, some strange things happen, which you only notice if you do precision measurements. It caught me out and I wasted hours chasing the effect. For everyday use, it's no issue, but it's better to get into the habit of turning PWR off when using the micro USB link. Let's see what's inside. The TC66 construction closely follows the other USB testers of the Yuideng family. Four screws hold a sandwich of front and back plate with a PCB in the middle. As mentioned already, the frazzled appearance of the front plate is because of the protective film on the front which I have not removed yet. The PCB design looks nice and clean. Immediately visible are the Bluetooth module in the upper right and a shunt resistor of 15 milliohms that looks enormous compared to the other components. You can see white tracks used for carrying the USB Type-C V-Bus and ground on both sockets and plug sides. Obviously, they really designed the PCB for up to 5 amps of current flowing through it. The Brain is a 32-bit general purpose controller, GD32F150GB from Gigatech using an ARM Cortex-M3 RISC core. This variant has 64K of flash memory, 8K of RAM, it has two I2Cs, USB and serial ports and a couple of digital IOs. On the analog side it has one 12-bit ADC that can be multiplexed to measure 13 channels. Next to it we have a 24LC256 which provides an additional 256K of I2C addressed EEPROM storage. A rather tiny but probably the most important chip in the TC66 is just above the EEPROM and on the left of the shunt. It's a Texas Instruments INA226 bidirectional current and power monitor chip. Understanding this chip is crucial for understanding how the TC66 works. I cover this in detail in the other video. For now, let's just say it basically adds a precision volts and current meter into the TC66. Next to the micro USB socket you see an M533B, which is a low dropout voltage regulator for 3.3 volts. 
To finish our PCB tour, here is the Bluetooth module add-on which you get when buying the TC66C variant. Obviously, someone was a bit careless in hand soldering the USB Type-C connector and partially melted the antenna, but it still works fine. The Bluetooth chip is hard to read, but it's a DA14580 system on chip which does BLE revision 4.2 and allows running onboard custom application code which can be updated over the air. Since the measurements of the TC66 are available through the micro USB connection, it made sense to completely automate all accuracy measurements using scripts. The source, which is just cut off on the left of the 3441A bench meter, is the USB control DPS5005, for which you can find a build video on my channel. I clipped the TC66 temporarily below the 3441A to have both in the same camera view as control, because I usually just start the script and then leave it running unattended for the hours it takes to do 600 measurements, increasing the voltage from 0 to 30 volts in tiny 50 millivolt steps. The main reason these runs take so much time is the number of steps of course and after each step I let everything settle for a few seconds before taking the measurement readings on both the TC66 and the 3441A. The results are pretty spectacular. The TC66 not only meets the claimed 0.05% of the spec, but it's certainly within 0.02% of the 6.5 digit multimeter down to about 2 volts. That's pretty amazing. I mentioned earlier the effect of leaving the PWR switch on when using the micro USB. This graph shows the effect. At 5 volts and beyond, when the TC66 starts pulling more and more of its operating current from the USB-C, the accuracy degrades and then slowly recovers. Initially, I thought this looked like the TC66 was range switching and I started to investigate along these lines. But it's really just a transition from one power source to the other and even with this effect, the error stays within 0.05% and would be unnoticeable in practice. You may be surprised about the spikiness of the graph and then both the spikes and the error seem to increase the closer we get to zero. The spikes come from the problem that the smaller the values get, a single digit difference between the 3441A and the TC66 has an increasing effect. A 1 millivolt difference at 100 millivolts is just 1%, but at 10 millivolts the same difference becomes 10%. Add to this that we get increasingly into the noise floor of the power supply set to produce ever smaller output voltages. The reason that the overall trend of the error graph increases towards the left has to do with offset voltages and is explained in the other video. To current now, and this plot here tracks the accuracy of the current readout. Because the 3441 is limited to 3 amp max, and I always stay well clear of that limit, I use the Priman BM869S for currents above 2.5 amps. The BM869S is a decent multimeter, but its DC accuracy in the 5 amp range is 0.5%, which is less than the claimed 0.1% of the TC66. So the fact that its plot lines up reasonably well with the 3441A section means that the BM869's performance is quite a bit better than that, but the fact remains that its section is really more an indication. I just don't have any way of verifying such high currents with the necessary accuracy to do the TC66 justice. Another thing I want to point out is that while the 3441A part of the plot was done using 10 mA increments resulting in 250 samples, the plot from 2.5A to 5A contains just 10 measurements using 250 mA increments. The reason is that the USB adapters I used to connect the TC66C for this test are not rated for more than 2 amps. To prevent them from literally melting, I have to limit the time they are so grossly overloaded. This is a good opportunity to mention that apart from USB Type-C connectors, no USB, A, mini or micro connector can handle more than 2 amps. In fact, most are only good for 1.5 amps and in many cases the thin wires in the cables or PCB tracks in connectors can't handle even less. I have already mentioned how central the INA226 chip for the TC66 is and 
Here is one more interesting thing related to that that I want to show. If I take the TC66 set to power itself from the USB type C and connect it with a plug end into the power source, it springs to life as it would expect and similar to the older UM25 and UM34, the display of the current and power is zero. If I feed the power from the other end, the socket side of the TC66, it suddenly shows a current and power. It displays its own power consumption. This is very different from the UM25 and UM34, which always hide their own consumption. Because the TC66 has seconded all measurements to the INA226 chip, it can't hide its own power consumption like its UM colleagues do. The reason that the current shows only when powered from the socket and not from the plug is that the shunt resistor sits between the socket and the electronics inside the TC66. When powered from the socket, the current used by the TC66 itself flows first through the shunt and is therefore displayed. From the plug, the internal current flows directly to the electronics and it does not reach the shunt. The user interface of the TC66 closely follows that of other Ruideng USB testers like the UM34 or UM25. We see the voltage, current and a calculated resistor value based on that. The power is shown in purple and we have the usual set of capacity and energy readouts in milliamp hours and milliwatt hours. Pressing K2 as the next button gets to a new feature offering recording, more about that in a moment. Continuing to the next page, we have the display of the charge protocol and the voltage reading of the D plus and D minus lines. The next screen is a new one and meant to allow the detection of different charge protocols. More about it and the next screen which is used to trigger different charge protocols in a moment. This is followed by the settings screen which has been redesigned because there are now more settings. Then we have a new screen showing the system information including firmware version because the TC66 can be updated with new firmware. It also shows how long the system has been up since the last power cycle and how many power cycles it had so far. Finally, there's this screen which just show volts, currents and watts. The arrow by the way indicates the direction of the current. And we are back to the first screen. A long press of K2 in the settings screen moves the cursor to the first setting, backlight timeout between 0 and 9 minutes with 0 meaning always on. Short K2 presses move to the next setting, while short K1 presses change the setting like here in the display brightness. Next we have Celsius or Fahrenheit for temperature. Whether you want enable or disable data exchange on the micro USB port. Enable or disable the Bluetooth radio. Rotate or rather flip the display. The PT soft switch, which I will cover later. The choice of English or Chinese. Restoring factory settings. And we are back at the first item, backlight. Before we talk about the new things in the TC66, here is one of my old gripes with Ruideng USB testers. We have super accuracy high resolution volts and current measurements, so why display the resistance calculated out of these with just one decimal? For lower values like here, instead of leading zeros, use the space to add more decimals please. So then let's talk about the first new thing, the recording. Let's say I want to find out what's going on with charge voltage and current when charging a phone. The TC66 can store up to 1440 pairs of voltage and current. It's not very well described in the manual, but by trial and error I found this out. At the default recording speed of storing a value pair every one second, which is the fastest, that gives you 1440 seconds of recording or exactly 24 minutes. You can increase the time in 1 second steps up to 60 seconds which gives you 1440 minutes or 24 hours. You enable changes by a long press of K2 and then move the, the white triangular cursor around using short presses of K2. Once you are at a field, use K1 to do something. At the period field, K1 increases the time. At the CE field, it clears everything previously recorded and at REC it starts or stops recording. 
Note that you can only change the period if recording is off and the memory is cleared. And you can only increment with the time jumping back to zero after 60. 10 seconds should give me 4 hours. The recording automatically stops when the storage is full. When ready, I need to enable recording and the rec indicator turns green and the yellow counter next to CE shows how much data in hours, minutes and seconds I have been recording so far, while the purple value shows in percent how much of the 1440 available storage slots have been used so far. The charger by the way is not a USB Type-C, so the phone uses other protocols to ask for more current. Apparently the TC66 thinks it uses an Apple protocol. Well, over 4 hours later the current is down to just about 100 milliamps, and the recording shows that the recording has stopped with 4 hours worth of data in memory. By the way that memory survives power cycles, you have to specifically clear it. There are two ways to get the recording out of the TC66, which I will cover in a bit. Either way, this is what you get in this case of the phone charging exercise. The voltage was nearly constant 5 volts all the time. It is interesting that three times during the process the phone or the charger asked for a break and the current dropped to zero and then to a more moderate 1 amp before going full throttle again. This is most likely an overheat sensor kicking in. Last not least, the bulk of the charge was more or less complete at record number 700, which means 7000 seconds or just under 2 hours. I think you agree that the TC66 recording capability is really very neat and a useful feature. One thing that springs to mind is that we can use it to conveniently find out the TC66 power consumption. Let's turn recording on after clearing the memory and setting the time period back to 1 second and yes, since it was 10 seconds before, that means 50 clicks of K1 to get up to 60 and then back to 1. With hurting fingers from all that, I am now in settings to select a backlight time of 1 minute. Turn Bluetooth off and now we have to wait for the 1 minute to expire. Backlight is usually the biggest power consumption next to Bluetooth. To measure the lowest possible power consumption, Bluetooth needs to be off, so we can't use it to read the current when the backlight turns off, and using micro USB power would bypass the shunt and so no power would register at all. This means the only way to measure the TC66 consumption would be to rig external meters to measure the USB-C current, but with a recording the TC66 does it all for us. Ok, so now that the display is off, I need to wait for a few seconds and then turn recording off and analyze it. Interestingly, turning Bluetooth off does not make any real impression. Low energy indeed. I did run an additional test with a Bluetooth connection actively running and the current did not increase in any significant way. But the backlight makes a real difference. The current drops from just below 24 milliamps to 17.5. So that's about the lowest power you can get. I use the same method to verify how low the voltage can get before the TC66 stops working. For this test I turned recording on and then lowered the voltage in 10 mV steps from 4 down to 3. The last recorded value was 3.2084, but even before at around 3.3V the display was already so dim that it could no longer be read. On to the next new feature, the charging protocol detection and protocol trigger. The idea here is to use the TC66 to tell you what power delivery protocols your charger or power bank can support and with a trigger feature you can force the charger into one of these power modes. These tests are between the TC66 and your charger and it's very important that you must not have anything else plugged into the other end of the TC66 because very likely it will either get damaged in the process or if it's a USB Type-C compliant device it may start talking protocols itself and mess up anything you are trying to do with the TC66. A few things to note. First. It does not matter which way around you use the TC66, just make sure nothing is connected to the other end. Make sure the PD switch is set to on and also the PD soft switch in the settings should be on. Note that changing the PD soft switch only takes effect after a power up. 
If you plan to do USB Type-C PD protocol testing, make sure the micro USB lead is not connected. This is because for this test, the TC66 needs to reboot into a different software and it can't do it if you keep it powered from the micro USB port. Maybe the same is true for other protocols I have not tested yet, or that might be added using firmware updates in the future, so it's probably a good idea to generally not use the micro USB lead when doing protocol testing. Contrary to what I just said about leaving the other end of the TC66 empty, I plugged the UM25 in, because I know the UM25 can handle it, and to show you why normal USB devices can get easily damaged by doing just protocol detection. On trying to get into protocol detection with a long press of K2, a warning pops up and only a short press of K1 actually starts the process. The TC66 goes through each line on the screen representing a protocol and turns those green that are supported. For example, this charger does quick charge 2.0 up to 12 volts but not to 20 and it does not support YY's SCP protocol. Now let me rewind this and run it again, this time look at the UM25 display instead of the TC66. It goes too quickly for the UM25 to catch it all, but during the detection the TC66 actually triggers the protocols, which means the output voltage goes 6 volts, 9 volts, 12 volts, even 20 volts if the charger supports it. That's why nothing should be plugged into the output during protocol detection. A long K2 press gets you into the trigger menu. No warning, you are supposed to know what you're doing. Short K2 presses cycles between the different protocols and K1 selects one. You don't actually have to do a detection first to trigger and even if you did a detection first, the trigger menu doesn't mark these in any way. Confusing is the color choice. In detection, a protocol in red means not supported. In trigger, it means selected for test. Let's try, for example, quick charge 2.0. You can use K2 to move up from 5 to 9 to 12 and 20 volts if your charger supports it. For this charger, 12 volt is the limit and selecting 20 volts does not change it. Again, the detection knew this already and could have shown that 20 volt wasn't possible. Anyway, K1 goes back the other way. With a long press of K2, you are back in the protocol selection. Let's have a look at quick charge 3.0. Instead of fixed voltages, this protocol allows a fine adjustment in steps of 200 millivolts. You can lower the voltage using K1, and raise it again using K2. Let's have a look at the USB power delivery or PD protocol for USB Type-C, which is the one I'm least familiar with because only fairly new chargers support it. The first thing the TC66 wants us to do is to unplug and reinsert the cable into the charger. I think what it really wants is to reboot into a different USB PD trigger software, so it needs us to do a power cycle to do that. It comes back with a program called PD 3.0 PPS. Not sure what the gear is supposed to mean, if you read it as a mode, it starts to make sense. I think the PS ready indicator shows that the data link between the TC66 and the charger is working. With K2, we can scroll between different modes 5 volts, 3 amps, 9 volts, 2 amps, 12 volts, 1.5 amps. This list actually reflects all that this charger, a basis Mirror Lake 18 watts, has told the TC66 it can do, so obviously your list may look different. We can see the voltage change, but of course, selecting different allowed currents can't be tested that way. The last two items allow selecting different voltages, and that is shown on the left, allowing selections of 1 volts, 100 millivolts or 20 millivolts steps. I selected 1 volt, pressed K1 and the TC66 reboots 4 times. Initially I was not sure if that is because of a crash in the TC66 software or the charger. I now think it's the charger because 
when I repeat this with a TC66 powered from micro USB after entering the PD3.0 PPS program, the TC66 just goes back to the trigger page, but the power from the charger drops four times in quick succession because the charger goes apparently through some form of reboot. Anyway, we are back after the charger reboot. At the crash I had the second last mode selected which is 3.3 volts to 5.9 volts 3 amps. I also had picked the 1 volt increment mode. Apparently the charger is sensitive to be commanded out of range. Anyway I don't want to get sidetracked into investigating a charger right now. First let's test if volt selection actually works at all. I selected the last mode which allows a range from 3.3 to 11 volts 2 amp which hmm, technically is 22 watts for an 80 watt charger. Go figure. Anyway, you can see that using one volt steps for raising and lowering the voltage works. And the same is true for 100 millivolts. And 20 millivolt steps. So it works, but I have the impression that playing with USB PT protocols is still pretty raw. Typically, this complexity is all baked into chipsets in chargers, phones, tablets and laptops. So the TC66 firmware allowing you to mess around may uncover shortcomings on either side. But I think it's great to be able to do it in the first place. There are actually two specific USB Type-C ways of asking for power. We looked at USB PD, but a much simpler method is called USB Type-C current. In this setup, all I'm feeding the TC66 is 5 volts and grounds for my bench power supply via an adapter. Running the protocol detection shows the expected everything red result except it looks my extremely crude setup somehow has magically developed the capability to support USB Type-C power delivery protocols. What really happens is that the TC66 USB Type-C PD protocol detection actually only recognizes the simple USB Type-C current method, which is just a pull-up resistor buried in the USB-C plug. This is mandated in all cables and adapters that have a USB Type-C plug on one side and a non-USB-C connector on the other. The standard value of 56K means permitted power delivery of 5 volts 500 milliamps. so technically, yes, the connection supports some form of Type-C power delivery, but since that's the only thing the TC66 detects, that's not very helpful. Just to point out, some USB-C to USB-A cables, like this, are a bit naughty. This one has a 10K resistor, which tells USB-C devices that up to 3 amps is available, even though the cable has no way of knowing if a charger into which it's plugged can actually handle that. Okay, let's talk about the mysterious PD and PD soft switch. In this test, the PWR, PD and PD soft switch are all on and the cable I'm using is a proper one with USB-C plugs on both ends and connects to a real USB Type-C charger. Once the cable is plugged in, the TC66 and the connected UM25 spring to life. Repeating the test with the PD switch off and nothing happens because the TC66 can no longer access the USB Type-C configuration channel and simply passes it through, but the UM25 as a non-USB Type-C device is totally ignorant of this. The charger thinks nothing is connected on the USB cable and simply does not turn the power on. Turning the PD switch back on and the charger now sees the TC66 pull-down resistor enabled by the PD soft switch in the settings assumes something is connected and turns power on. This is symbolized by the nicely drawn icon of a resistor connected to a ground plane. Incidentally, there is only one of these pull downs in the TC66, so the plug always has to be the right way around. Which, because a USB Type-C plug can go in either way, means you may need to resort to trial and error to find the correct way. The TC66 gets away with that because its other end is a fixed plug, 
which for reasons explained in the other video means the standard allows that it does not have to implement all the multiplexing needed for full reversibility. Reversing the plug on a rather stiff cable, again the proper way around, and the TC66 pull down is again detected by the charger which turns on power. If I now turn off the PD soft switch and unplug and replug the TC66, it stays dark. Again, the charger thinks nothing is connected. This is a mode that may confuse people thinking that TC66 is dead. No matter how you turn the TC66 or the plugs, it will stay off and without power to go into the settings, you can't turn the soft switch back on. You locked yourself out, so to say. The only recovery is plugging it through an adapter into a non-USB-C power socket, which are always powered, or, as in here, feed external power through the micro-USB port. While this brings the TC66 back to life, the USB-C power is still off, as you can see, by the still dark UM25. But now I can re-enable the PD soft switch in the settings, which comes into effect at the next restart. With all the knowledge gathered so far, it's possible to draw up a model on how the TC66 works. This is simplified of course, but I think it's useful. First of all, all USB Type-C signals pass directly through the TC66. I simplify this in my drawing by putting the differential signals into single but wider lanes. The TC66 is therefore completely transparent to external devices connected by USB-C, with the TC66 in the middle. By that I mean they don't realize the TC66 has been inserted into their connection. There are two slight exceptions for this rule. First, the TC66 inserts a 50 milliohm shunt into VBus to be able to measure the current. That value is so low that it's in the order of cable resistance, so won't cause any problems. The second exception is the configuration channel or CC. To be truly transparent on the CC line, the TC66 has a PD switch. If that is off, CC is completely untouched by the TC66. But if you want to test protocols, you need the CC line. Also, the charger will not even turn on VBUS if it does not see an RD pulldown. Hence, for protocol testing, you need the PD switch closed and the PD soft switch on, shown here as a MOSFET, but other ways of implementation are possible. I suppose one of the reasons the PD soft switch is not permanently on is to allow testing if a USB compliant charger responds correctly with RD present or not. The other reason is that RD may cause a 1 mA of extra current to flow via the CC that bypasses the shunt and therefore causes an error if you measure capacity. To avoid this, it's best to turn PD off if you don't need it. There are two power sources, the micro USB port and VBUS from the USB Type-C that feeds the 3.3V regulator for the TC66 electronics. If the power switch is left on, with micro USB connected, USB Type-C voltage will take over once its VBUS exceeds the voltage coming from the micro USB. As discussed, the shunt sits electrically at the socket side, so power for the TC66 own consumption that comes from the plug end goes directly into the regulator and is not measured, but it's fully accounted for if the power comes from the socket end. This is good to know if you want to accurately measure battery capacity and you don't want to use external power from the micro USB port. Simply, if the current flows from the socket to plug, the TC66 own consumption is included in the result. If it goes the other way, it's excluded. This means for capacity testing, the battery should always be connected to the socket side and charges to the plug. Of course, if you don't care about capacity and don't mind the extra 25mA current that might be shown, it doesn't matter what's plugged in where. If you run the downloaded Ruideng USB meter software for the TC66 under Windows 10, it comes up like this. 
but despite the TC66 being connected by micro USB cable, it won't recognize it until the driver is installed. I was recording this from a separate monitor, hence the need to track the pop-up windows into the recording. Do we always trust Giga Device Semiconductor Beijing? No offense, but I would never leave that box ticked, regardless of the publisher. Create user interface. Click cancel to exit. Why not call it exit then? For me, cancel means abort and undo installation. But anyway, cancel it is. That did not do anything for the connection. It turns out you have to unplug and replug the USB cable after the driver installation, which is, in our fairness, actually written in the manual. So let's connect. Oh, it contacted the mothership and found new firmware. Version 1.15 is available. What's new? Apparently something to do with Bluetooth. I think a pass, which I explain later. We have the usual textual display of the values you could see on the screen of the TC66 together with a graphical plot. Clicking on the offline data and it actually reads the last recording from the TC66. You may remember this graph from when I explained the recording feature using the phone charging scenario. So this is one way of getting the recorded data out. After a glance into the manual, it appears that right-clicking on the graph window allows export to Excel. Back to the real-time data and to see some action, I plugged the TC66 between a charger and a phone. The graphs and readouts spring to life. As for the offline data, you can export the real-time graph to Excel. This is pretty much all it can do, but I think it kind of does the job and it allows firmware updates. For myself, I found it a bit limiting and so I wrote my own software, which I show in a moment. For Android, the TC66 has its own app. You can install it from the Google Play Store. It is different from the Ruideng app, which handles the other Ruideng products like the UM25 or UM34. I guess it's because the TC66C uses Bluetooth low energy. It works pretty easy and convenient as you can see and the display shows the usual items. You can't actually do anything apart from silly things like rotating the TC66 screen. To give it something to plot, I plug the TC66 connected to a charger into the tablet itself. This produces the usual graph, which also records in the background. You can export it by pressing share, which fires up Microsoft Office, which allows you to save it as an Excel file. Note that at least in 1.14 firmware, you can't get recordings from the TC666 internal memory through the Bluetooth interface, which would also apply to the iOS app. This means your only option is the Ruideng Windows software or make your own, which is what I have done. The good folks from Sigrog.org have collected reverse engineered data from various sources on the protocols used by the TC66. Please go to this URL for more info, which I also include in the description of this video. Without going into more details, the Bluetooth communication and serial communication of the micro USB link work very differently. As you can see, both implement the poll command, which returns 192 bytes of data, ARS encrypted. The poll data contains voltage, current, power, resistance, capacity, energy and temperature, in addition to serial number, version and such. The serial interface also has a command called getrec, which dumps the contents of the recording memory as up to 1440 volts and current pairs. That data is not encrypted. As you can see, at least for firmware version 1.14, the Bluetooth protocol has no getrec command, so you can't use it for getting recorded data. The serial data also has a firmware update command, but so far I have not implemented that in my software. 
my reluctance to update the firmware is because that may break whatever the community has reverse engineered, in particular the AIS key needed for decrypting. Version 1.14 does what I need for now on. I'll wait for major improvements before considering an update. To use my program, which you can download from my GitHub page, link in the description, you need Python, of course, and PySerial and PyCryptodome to be installed. The TC66 shows up as a so-called abstract control model communication device, which means its name under Linux will be something like TTY ACM0 and it just works. Under Windows, it's more complicated because it does not recognize this type of devices without a driver and there isn't a generic one. I tested this under Windows 7 and in the end I had to resort to install the Ruidang driver from their PC software pack. I only installed the driver and in this case not the rest of the Ruidang software. After plugging the TC66 back in, Windows recognized it and created a standard COM port, COM10 in my case, which works fine with my software. My program is a command line utility because all it does is collecting data for later use with spreadsheets, and it works under Windows as well as Linux. It might work for Macs, but I have no way of testing. The main parameters are the serial port and the output file name. The output file name defaults to a name starting with TC66 and followed by a date timestamp so that recording files do not override each other. For polling, you can specify a time interval, which defaults to one second, and whether you want all data or just volts, amps and power. In polling mode, the program collects data until you press Ctrl C. If I just specify the port, the program polls the TC66 every one second and saves the data in the output file. To show what's going on, it prints time, volts and current on the screen. The output file is a comma-separated value file and opens in Excel or LibreOffice Calc, which I'm using here. You can see the values in the four columns, relative time, volts, current and power, allowing you to do whatever plotting or analysis you want to run. If you want more data, you can specify the all parameter. The printout on the screen looks very much like before, but the program is now collecting and saving a lot more data, resulting in bigger output file sizes. Opening the CSV file shows additional columns with resistance, the data or group 0 capacity and energy values and the same for group 1, the temperature and the D plus and D minus voltages. The other mode is selected when you specify the get rec option. With that, the program just dumps the recorded data, if there is any, and exits. It's not always 1440 records, it depends on how much recording storage was actually used by the TC66. The data format consists only of volts and current pairs. Let's see what we have here by using the LibreOffice Calc graphic function. Since it's a straightforward data arrangement, a simple XY scatter plot is a good option and the default settings are fine for this. And there is the graph. It should be familiar by now because it's the same plot of the phone charging scenario the Ruidang software produced earlier. To summarize, the TC66 is very powerful but quite complex and to help me and you if you decide to get one, remembering how to use it best, may I present my TC66 cheat sheet. The orange box deals with capacity measurements in charging and discharging scenarios. If you want to measure the capacity of a battery by discharging it, use this configuration because that way the extra current drawn by the TC66 is correctly accounted for. To measure how much charge goes into a battery, use the second setup because in this scenario the extra current produced by the charger just to feed the TC66 is not inadvertently added to the measured capacity. If either of these configurations are not possible because no matching sockets, cables or adapters are available, 
use external power from the micro USB port and turn PWR switch off. This produces accurate capacity measurements regardless which ports are used by battery or charger. The setup at the bottom is a reminder that for protocol testing only a charger is to be plugged in. It does not matter which side, but the other side should not have anything connected. The diagram on the upper right, in fetching purple, is a reminder that for anything where one end or both are using non-USB Type-C plugs, sockets, cables or adapters, you should turn off the PD switch. This is also applicable to the orange box scenarios. PD is not needed because you are using plain old conventional USB and a small extra load caused by PD can cause tiny errors in capacity measurements. The green box is for scenarios where proper USB Type-C is used. If the TC66 is inserted in a pure USB-C connection between two devices, you should first try PD off because the two devices may negotiate power delivery between each other and you don't want the TC66 to mess it up. Remember, you may have to flip the connection. If that doesn't work, turn PD and the PD soft switch on so at least the TC66 enables power delivery. You may still have to flip the connection to get that working. The second scenario is using the TC66 externally powered. In that case, PD should be off because the TC66 does not need it for normal measurements. Only enable it if the other device on the USB Type-C for some reason do not do it themselves, which is already a good indication that something isn't quite right with the cable or the devices. The last scenario is again for protocol detection and triggers, this time USB Type-C only. For that to work, PD and the soft switch must both be on, regardless whether you use external power from the micro USB port or not. To wrap up, for the price, the TC66 offers truly outstanding accuracy and resolution for both voltage and current measurements. If you power it externally from the micro USB port and the PWR switch is off, the input resistance is a fair 200 to 400K. Current measurements are equally good and the limit of 2.5 amps is only because I can't verify the accuracy and resolution for higher currents with the precision needed for the TC66. But there's no reason to assume the values would be worse at higher currents. In fact, the trend is the higher the current, the lower the error. But of course, eventually, the heating of the shunt will cause some drift at prolonged high current measurements. Notable is the super low burden voltage, which beats every other meter I have. It uses not much power and the capability to power it externally removes any concern you always have with traditional USB testers using the USB connection they are supposed to measure for their own operating power. The same is true for minimum voltage of 3.2 volts, which only applies if you don't power it externally. The TC66 or TC66C, if you want the Bluetooth capability, is a great USB tester and highly recommended. In fact, it is way too good for just USB testing. That's why I'm going to show in one of the next videos how to use the TC66 as an extremely accurate multimeter of sorts. If you like this kind of content, consider subscribing and maybe becoming a Patreon. As a Patreon, you get to see my videos at least 24 hours before they go public and there's exclusive content as well as an interactive blog. Your support enables me to do things like the TC66 and make independent and impartial reviews. Please follow the links in the description of the video. Thanks for watching.